We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see you all here. We are, uh, like, like Pastor Michael said, we're in week two of our series called The Blessed Life, and we're talking about the, just the beauty that is available in, in the life that we live as followers of Jesus when we, when we model the generosity that he has uh, modeled for us. Hey, before we get into the message, though, I want to uh, use some pastoral privilege for just a moment and, and highlight a few more things. One, our men's breakfast is this Saturday. So if you are uh, one of our men that, that or maybe uh, you, you, your first time here at ACC and you'd like to come to our men's breakfast this Saturday morning, we meet in the cafe. It's huge. It's awesome. We're gonna, it's going to be even bigger this time than it was last time. So make sure you come to our men's breakfast. Also, don't forget October 2nd. Everyone say that. October 2nd. Say Vision Sunday. You want to be here on that Sunday because if you are here, not only, uh, listen, it's limited to the first 800 people in the door are going to get a shirt. I said everyone will get one, and I was told we only have 800 shirts. So not everyone will get one, but make sure you're here. If you're one of the first 800 and we got a shirt in your size, we want to give you a shirt that Sunday. It's really cool. It's really comfy. It's the shirt that you're going to want to wear over and over again. So make sure you're here on Vision Sunday on the 2nd. And then that next Sunday, this is really exciting, the reason uh, we do what we do is we want to expand the reach of the kingdom throughout this community. We want to make a greater impact for this, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the kingdom in this community. And one of the things we recognize is that October every year is the largest attended month within churches in our community. October is kind of when we see kind of that influx of everyone's kind of got their, their fall pattern back and, and people start kind of re recirculating back to the church and all that. Um, so with that in mind, and a few other things that we know are coming in October, we're really excited, and you, we're going to give you a couple weeks heads up. We're adding a third service on October 9th for, for you to choose from. So October 9th will begin, yeah. Um, Especially, you would notice if you're at our next service, it gets really difficult to find a place to sit in this room. And so, with that in mind, and making sure that we can make more space for more people to enjoy uh, what God has in store for them, uh, you'll be able to choose between 8.30, 10, and 11.30, instead of 9 and 11. 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Uh, I recommend waking up early, getting your day going, and coming to our 8.30 service, because that's usually the one that has the fewest people. If you like a lot of elbow room, join us at 8.30. It'll be awesome. All right. Church, can I, can I tell you about a reoccurring dream that I have? I'm curious if anyone else has this reoccurring dream. I should be honest, I don't have this reoccurring dream anymore. I used to have it all the time. And it was this reoccurring dream that I would find out uh, that I had been enrolled in a class all semester long, like a college level course, and I walk in like with a week left realizing that I'm in that class and I haven't attended or taken a single test and I'm sitting there completely unprepared knowing I'm going to flunk the thing. Anyone else uh, have this dream? <laughs> Come on. Am I, I know it's weird. Uh, maybe uh, you've, you've experienced this in real life, right? You walk into a class that you actually know that you have, right? You've been coming to the class, you walk in, and then the teacher says, all right, everyone get out a number two pencil. And you're thinking, what test? Right? I didn't know about a test. And you walk in and all of a sudden there's a test and you're like, I'm completely unprepared. Did you tell us about this test? Where did we know? And sometimes we find out there's a test and we're not really happy about it. Well, today I kind of given this message, this, this title of what test. Last week, we started this series called The Blessed Life, and we are kind of our focus last week, if I could be fair, kind of give it an overall summary, was that it is better to give than to get. 
If you really want to experience the blessed life, the Bible says it is more blessed to give than it is to get. Better to give than to receive. So we're talking about the beauty of uh, how the blessed life is one, and, and we introduced this last week, it's better to give than to get. We talked about how time, we can give our time. We talked about our talent, we can give our talent. We talked about our treasure, we can give our treasure. We can share our resources. All these are all different ways that we can be generous. Well, today I want to kind of zoom in on the the treasure part of time, talent, and treasure. And here's why I think that us giving of our financial resources is one of the greatest tests of our faith. Because you think about this for a moment. When you give of your talent, you don't really end up with less talent. In fact, at the end of it, you probably end up with more talent, right? When you exercise your talent, when you go and you take something you're really good at and you use it for the kingdom of God, by the time you're done, not only do you still have that talent, but you actually have it with even more experience doing that thing, right? You end up with more. And think about time, right? When you go to bed, the, someone deposits 24 new hours into your bank account and you get 24 hours. You didn't have to work for it. Uh, uh, God willing, right? You get another 24 hours. God decides when, the, you know, you get cut off. But at the end of the day, time is something you don't have to work for. It's just given to you. You have it. There's a limited amount, but you're going to, if you use it up, you're going to get more of it tomorrow without doing anything for it. But treasure, you have to work for, for your, your income. You have to work for money typically, right? It's something that either you work for it or someone before you worked for it. At some point, someone worked for it, and when you give it away, there's a point at which you could give away enough that you end up at zero. There's like a zero amount, and it's not something that just kind of typically replenishes itself unless you work for more. So when you think about time, talent, and treasure, if you really want to test your heart, It's going to come in the form of learning how to be generous, not just with time and talent, but with our treasure. Listen, if you are in this room and you are not a follower of Jesus yet, first of all, we're really glad that you're here. This is a really great place to come and say, listen, I don't know what I believe about this book yet. I don't know what I believe about Jesus yet. I don't even know what I believe about this church yet but I'm just here to explore. That's really great. I'm really glad that you're here. This is a great, safe place to do that. And this message isn't really geared towards you. You see, the the command in Scripture to test your heart through giving generously to your church, through giving generously towards the kingdom of God, it's a command that's given to Christ followers, to people who follow Christ. So if you're in this room and you're saying, I've already made a decision to model my life after the life of Christ, well, then this message is for you. If you haven't made that decision yet, you're going to learn some stuff about Christ followers, but I'm not asking you to, to, to make this leap yet. All right? So here's what I want to uh, give you a little bit of a heads up. Well, let me ask you this real fast. How many of you get paid monthly? Like once a month, you get an income, like a paycheck pops up in the mail. So some of you are monthly people. How many of you get paid like either every other week or twice a month. You get paid somewhere around twice a month. That's typically the most. How many of you get paid weekly? Any any weekly people? All right, how many of you get paid uh, as money comes in, you get to take some of it, right? Some of you like real estate and things like that. How many, some people like that. How many of you don't get paid? All right, that's cool. Uh, That's all right. Um, You probably earn better than the rest of us earthly rewards. A a lot of people who who don't get a a, a physical paycheck are earning heavenly rewards. But think about every time you get paid, what you're really doing is you're taking a test. Every time a payment comes into you, you're taking a test. And the test sounds something like this, whom are you going to thank for that income? Who do you recognize as the provider and actually the owner of that that resource? It's a test that all of us take. Some of us take it monthly. Some of us take it twice a month. Some of us take it, uh, you know, every week. Some of us take it every once in a while. Some of us very rarely. But listen, it's a test. So I want to give you a heads up on where we're going to be in God's Word today. If you want to grab a copy of God's Word, 
and turn in your copy uh, to Malachi 3. If you have a hard time finding Malachi, the easiest way to find it is it's the last book of the Old Testament. So you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like those New Testament gospels, and just work back one book, and you're in Malachi 3. We're also going to be in 2 Chronicles 31 today, if you want to find that ahead of time and put a finger there or a bookmark there or something. So in Malachi chapter 3, I'm going to start reading in verse 6. And this is what God says in Malachi 3, verse 6. He says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. And then he goes on, and he says, that is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. I love what he's essentially saying there. What he's saying is, hey, if I hadn't made a promise to be faithful in loving you, you guys are terrible. I would have wiped you out by now. You would be gone. But because I'm the Lord and because I do not change, that's the only reason that you have not been destroyed yet. So he says that to his people. And then he goes on in verse 7. He says, ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away. I I love what's pointed out in their response. God says, listen, I want you to return to me. And the people are saying, but God, how could we return to you if we never left? And what it highlights is that there are many people who claim to be followers of Christ or who are right now in this church, right? There's many of us who are like, I am close to God. But there's going to be evidence that we talk about today that says, are you though? Do you really trust him? Do you really know all the blessing that he's provided to you? In fact, what we're going to talk about today is a test to see, are you really as close to God the Father, the Lord of heaven's armies, as you claim to be? Or do you just think that you're really close? Because these people were like, God, how could we come back if we've never left? And he says, let me tell you, you're not actually as close to me as you think. It goes on in verse 8. It says, This is what God says, should people cheat God? Your version of the Bible might say, should people rob God? Or maybe even in the the NIV, it says, will a mere mortal rob God? It says, you have, yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And then God says, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings do to me. So people are saying, God, when did we ever leave you? How could we come back if we never left? And God says, listen, you guys have been robbing me right and left. And they say, how did we rob you, God? And he says, you've been cheating me of what you owe me, the tithes and offerings do to me. So let me show you quickly, if you have one of those paper notepads, you'll kind of see where I am. I want to show you three people, uh, three groups of people, if you will, that get robbed when we withhold tithes and offerings as followers of Christ. The first is real obvious. We rob God. We rob God when we withhold our tithes and offerings. That one's kind of the gimme because it's covered really clearly in Scripture. God says, you have robbed me. You see, there's a difference that many of us as followers of Christ, that we, we have to learn the difference between these two phrases, between ownership and stewardship. And the difference between ownership, ownership means that what you have, that you are the, that your name's on the title of it. You're, it's yours, right? Stewardship means you're holding on to somebody else's things and you're, you're managing them for them. You're investing them, you're using them for, but ultimately they are still the owner, And the truth is that as a follower of Christ, one of the things that we learn is that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In fact, he owns the stinking hills, right? He owns everything. And if God owns everything, that means that we don't own anything. We are simply stewards of what God has placed in our bank accounts and uh, the home that maybe we we live in or the the car that maybe we drive in and all the, the things that we have, all of those things, God has just given them to us on loan as stewards. He's saying, listen, I'm going to give you this. I want you to manage it for me, but please don't get distracted and think that somehow it's now yours. Because when we take something, if somebody lent you money 
and asked you to hang on to, not lent it to you, but asked you just to, to guard it and watch it, maybe even invest it in some way, and you took it and you spent it on yourself, I think we'd all agree that that is theft, that that's robbing the owner. And the truth is what God is saying is that when you do that, you, you rob me. There's a really stupid movie from back when I was a kid, and I always thought it was really funny. Anyone ever seen the movie Dumb and Dumber? Okay, really, really silly movie. There's one scene, well, the whole concept of the movie is these two guys, they're not very smart. They have this briefcase full of cash. They know it's not their money. They know it's someone else's, and they're actually, the whole movie plot is they're trying to get the money back to the owner of the money. But along the way of having this cash, when it breaks open and they see how much is in there, they know how, many, how much money, they, they start spending it. It's not theirs. And at, at one point at the very end, the owner of the money opens up the briefcase and it's filled to the brim with paper IOUs. And the guy holds up a napkin, 350000 He says, that's the Lamborghini. You might want to hang on to that one. Listen, if you spend what isn't yours, that's robbing the owner. That's theft. So you're robbing God. Another person that you're robbing is you're robbing yourself. In fact, if we keep reading in Malachi, right, it says in, in verse 9, it says, you are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. He says, the reason right now that you're, you're not experiencing blessing, the reason that the blessing of God is not being poured out on you is because you have been robbing me. You've been cheating me. And he explains it, that you are under a curse. You see, you are robbing yourself of the blessing that God would like to pour out on you when you withhold your tithes and offerings. Listen, I want to be really clear here. We talked about this last week. God doesn't need anything from you. If you decide to rob him and withhold what is his, what he's asked you to give back to him, if you choose to do that, listen, he's still going to accomplish his purposes without you. But he allows you to be a part of the story that he's writing. Out of love for each of us, he says, listen, I'm going to do what I'm going to do with or without you, but I would love for you to be woven into the story that I'm writing and to be able to store up for yourself incredible treasure in heaven and to be blessed here on earth while you're part of what we're doing together. But what happens when we withhold, we're robbing ourselves of the blessing. Let me show you this in two New Testament verses. In 2 Corinthians 9, it says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. In other words, if you don't plant much, you're not going to get much. Is kind of what's being said there in Luke 6. It says, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Now listen, I want to be really clear here. Both of these verses seem to indicate that the reason we should give is so that we can get. It seems to indicate that the purpose of giving is so that you can get. And sometimes we also think, and listen, I want to make sure that you, you all understand this, that the purpose of giving isn't so that you can get. The purpose of giving is because, number one, you've been commanded to do it. It's an act of obedience. It's an act of worship. And God promises when you do that, when you lay down your greed and your, your desire to collect and hoard, that you will receive blessing for it. It doesn't mean a financial blessing. It might. It doesn't mean that when you give uh, $1 that you just look back in your wallet and there's going to be two in its place. That, it could mean that, but that's not necessarily what it means. It just means that you will receive blessing. God knows exactly what you need. Listen, we have plenty of evidence in Scripture to back up that sometimes when you are faithful to give the way God has asked you to, that he's not going to necessarily bless you financially. Again, look no further than John the Baptist. Look no further than the early disciples. I don't see examples of wealth. I see examples of people who lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. But here's what you will, here's what this blessing looks like. God will give you exactly what is good for you. 
God will pour out a blessing on you. And what is that blessing? It is what you need and what is good for you in that moment. God will give that to you when you are faithful. So when you don't tithe, when you don't provide gifts to God, you're not only cheating God, you're also robbing yourself. Here's another group that gets robbed when you hold, withhold, is you rob others. In fact, I want to just challenge you for a moment. Look to your right and to your left. I want you to see who gets robbed when you aren't generous within the, the commands of, of Scripture. I mean, check out this verse. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says this, if one part suffers, this is one part of the body of Christ, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you are a part of it. The most beautiful picture of the church is that each of us recognizes that we are a part of the body of Christ, and that each of us is meant to be attached and actively involved in the work of the church. Now listen, if you walk into a room and you see parts of a body, but they're not attached, what do we call that? It's a crime scene right? Something horrible has gone on in that space, if that's what you're seeing. And I don't want people to walk into this church or any church in this world, a Bible-believing church, and see a crime scene of people who think, you know what, I'm just better detached from what the body is doing. We are meant to be connected and attached to the body of Christ. And when you withhold generous giving to the church, what you're really doing is you're robbing others, So what should we do then? If we don't want to rob God and we don't want to rob ourselves and we don't want to rob others, remember the whole concept of this message today is what test. And here's the deal. What what we should do then is, is what God asks us to do. If we keep reading in Malachi, God asks us to test him. You know, it's not only a test that we take for ourselves, but it's a test that God tells us we can take We can put him to the test. It's like a a two-way test. Let me show you this in Malachi, back to Malachi 3. If we keep reading into verse 10, this is what God says. Remember the people said, what should we do? We never left you, God. And he says, yes, you did leave me. You've been robbing from me. And then God says this, bring all of the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing. There's that word. I will pour out, say it with me, a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Then he says this, put me to the test. I don't want you to miss the significance of God saying, put me to the test. There's plenty of places in scripture where God says, do not test the Lord your God. And yet right here he's saying, listen, I'm gonna give you a, a pass in this one area to test me. I want you to also see, as Malachi is kind of sharing these thoughts, he says what? Says the Lord of heaven's army. I want you to make sure you all know, these are words that are coming from the Lord of heaven's army, not from Pastor Matt. Some of you are like, oh, that's just the pastor up there. That's just the church and its leadership telling us that we should give. No, listen, it's the Lord of heaven's army saying that this is something that we're called to do. In fact, we see this Lord, uh, Malachi keeps pointing out who is speaking. If we keep reading in verses 11 and 12, it says, your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's army. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. I don't know about you, but the Lord of heaven's armies is much more intimidating to me than just saying the Lord. I I heard a story once of a pastor whose daughter had gotten to the age where she was going to begin dating. And this pastor came up with a plan. And essentially, any boy that wanted to date his daughter would have to come and sit down and have a meeting with him. And they would go over some ground rules. And as long as the the, the boy agreed to the ground rules, then he would have him, he would pull out a baseball bat and have him sign the baseball bat. 
He wouldn't mention the baseball bat. He didn't say what the bat was for. He would just say, if you agree to these rules, sign here. You know what that does? That's, that's a baller move right there. Listen to what that is. That's saying you're not only making a promise to me, you're also making a promise to this bat. I don't know about you, but when I hear, says the Lord of heaven's armies, what God is saying is this promise I'm telling you what I'm going to do. This isn't just a promise from the Lord. This is the Lord and all of the armies of heaven are going to back this up. Test me in this. Test me in this. Let me pause for a quick moment and make sure we all understand what this word, when it says tithes and offerings, what is this word tithe? Maybe you don't know what a tithe is or what it means. And it literally means a tenth part. It means a tenth. And kind of the understanding of a biblical tithe is that when you receive an income, you say, listen, I want to to worship God by giving a tenth of that income back to God through my local church. I want to give this part back. And this tithe, one of the things I love about this concept of a tenth part is it doesn't matter if you make a bunch of money or you make, you know, a dollar a day. For everybody, there's a fair amount that you are, uh, it's proportional giving. You're giving in proportion to what you get in. And that's this concept of a tithe. Now, you know, in, in the New Testament church, there's a lot of debate about this concept of a tithe. There's a lot of questions that people will ask about a tithe. Some of the questions sound like this. You know, should we still do it? Isn't this an an Old Testament thing? And now we're no longer under the law and we're under grace? Isn't isn't that, that's a question. Or when and where? How often should we give a tithe? And where should we give our tithe? These are all questions that come up often within the church. So I wanna uh, tell you three things about a tithe that I think you'll you'll find in Scripture. If you have your note sheets, these are your fill-in-the-blanks today. Number one is that tithing is a test. Tithing is simply a test. Remember last week we talked about it ultimately being a stress test for your heart. The reason why when, when a cardiologist wants to really challenge you and, and really test the strength of your heart, they're not just going to take your heart uh, information while you're standing there resting. They're going to get you on a treadmill. They're going to get you running. And when they really stress out your heart and get it beating at its maximum levels, then they're really testing whether or not your heart is healthy. Well, giving is a stress test, if you will, for the strength of your heart. Believe it or not, this number 10%, it actually is tied very frequently to God testing people in Scripture. You're going to notice that when a lot of times when God tests people, the number 10 is actually very uh, specific. In fact, let me, let me uh, give you a little bit of a quiz. You guys want a quiz? All right. How many plagues were there? 10. All right. I want you to, I want you to be a little more confident. How many plagues were there? 10. All right. Another way I could have said that is how many times did God test Pharaoh's heart? Ten. All right. How many commandments are there? Ten. All right. Now, these next questions, I'm going to admit, they're probably not ones that you would know right off the top of your head, but I think you've probably picked up the pattern, all right? So I want you to answer, all right? How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? How many times were, uh, were Jacob's wages changed? Come on, you get a little more confident, all right? Uh, how, many days was, uh, how many days was Daniel tested? How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? How many days of testing are mentioned in Revelation? How many disciples were there? Oh, I, man, you're supposed to fall for that. That's right. I had to maybe keep the rhythm a little fast. Yeah, but listen, here's the point. In Scripture... This number 10 is often tied to God testing someone's heart, testing people's obedience, testing people's desire to do things his way. And here's the thing about this test. I mentioned this earlier. It's a two-way test. Not only is it a stress test for your heart, but God says, test me. God gives us permission to not only test our own hearts, but to test him in our generosity. 
You know, it's the exact same word that is used for test here that would have been used of testing whether or not like gold was real or not. I don't know if you've ever taken jewelry to someone who buys gold and to maybe try to sell it when gold prices are really great. And what they're going to do is they're going to take that little gold ring or gold necklace or brooch or whatever, right? And they have this little thing that kind of looks like a, like a stone, a little bit of a grit to it. And they're going to rub it on there and get a little bit of gold dust basically sitting on there. And they take a special acid and they're going to drip it on there. And then they can actually test if it's 14 carat or 18 carat or 24 carat. And they can know based on what happens with the acid that they put on there. It's really cool. But it's, it's this way that we test the gold to see how pure the gold is and whether or not the gold is even real. You know, it might come back that this isn't gold at all. It's just gold plated. What God is doing here is he's saying, listen, not only are you stress testing your heart, but you actually get to decide and see by giving whether or not I'm the real deal. You get to test me for purity. You get to test me for honesty. You get to test me and see if I really am who I say I am. You know, back in the day when you were probably a child, if you wanted a friend to do something and you told them to do it, they might say no, right? Hey, man, I, you should jump off that roof onto that pile of dirt. No, I'm not going to do that. What would we add to it, right? I dare you. Oh, now it just got a little more real, didn't it? You got dared to do it. But they're probably still going to say no, because jumping off a roof on a pile of dirt, not a good thing. So you would probably add to it, I double dare you. You know what gets real, though? When you triple it and you add the dog in there, I triple dog dare you. Someone's getting up on that roof and jumping off at that point, right? You've been triple dog dared. Here's what God is saying in this test. He's saying, listen, I dare you. I double dare you. I triple dog dare you. Test me in this. You will not regret it. In fact, the way I really understand Malachi 3.10, remember, the, let me put the verse up again. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Try it. I triple dog dare you. What God is really saying here is, listen, if you give a tithe into my storehouse, you will not regret it. I promise Here's the second thing I want you to know about tithing, is that tithing is biblical. Tithing is biblical. It's a concept that wasn't made up by churches. It was something that God made up to, to help further the cause of the church and the further, cause, further the cause of the Great Commission, to make sure that the good news is taken to the ends of the earth. God says, listen, well, you, this concept of a tithe we find here in Scripture. A lot of people will say, well, listen, Matt, but don't... I think you should be more clear because tithing was something that came from the law. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law and we're no longer under the law, but now we're under grace. I've heard it a thousand times. It's something non-tithers say. <laughs> let, me, let me say this. Tithing as a principle existed far before the law ever existed. And I'll show you two examples. In Genesis 14, we, we see Abraham give a tithe to the priest. In Genesis 28, Jacob talks about tithing to God. There's more examples. Here's the point, is that tithing is something that existed as a principle long before the law ever existed. What the law did was help to clarify a little bit about how and why we give the tithe. In fact, let me show you some clarity. In, in Deuteronomy 26, now we're into where the law is being given, Right? We're told to take our first fruits. So now we know that not only are we supposed to tie the tenth, but it's supposed to be the first thing that we do with our income. We're going to talk more about that next week. But we're also supposed to, it says, to tithe it to your designated place of worship. So in the law, we have this a little bit of clarity. And there's much more throughout the Old Testament. And some people will say this. Here's another thing that people say about the tithing and, and how it fits in the Bible. Some people say, yeah, but tithing is never mentioned in the New Testament. We're now in the New Testament. We're in a new, 
uh, you know, we're in the, the, the kind of the part of the, the, the world history that the church is a part of. The, the tithing's never mentioned there. Well, let me ask you, if you're a follower of Christ in this room, would you give a tithe if you claim to be a follower of Christ if Jesus told you to do it in the New Testament? Let me ask over here. All right. No, I'm joking. Listen, it's one of those questions that for some reason takes us far too long to answer. It's one of those things like, man, if Jesus himself asked me to give a tenth of my income to the, towards the Great Commission and through my local church, would I be faithful in doing that? Why does it take us so long to answer that question? So I ask, you know, if Jesus said it in the New Testament, would you do it? Let me show you where Jesus says it in the New Testament. All right, Matthew 22, verse 23. It says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, he says, for you are careful to tithe, there's that word, to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. He says, you guys, uh, you guys tithe, you, get, you take tithing so seriously that even the, the, the tiniest herbs from your gardens, you tithe on those as well. He says, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. And here it comes. You ready? You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. You ought to tithe, says Jesus. All right? It's a biblical concept. Here's a third thing, is that tithing is a blessing. Tithing is a test. Tithing is biblical, and tithing is a blessing. So now, go ahead and turn over to that Second Chronicles 31, and I want to show you what kind of blessing tithing can be. A little bit of a, a, a backstory so that you understand the context of Second Chronicles 31. So Hezekiah uh, is king of Judah, and he is seeking to restore the way the, the people of God operate back to the way God has asked them to operate in Scripture. He's seeking to put things back the way they're supposed to be done to reinstate God's command specifically for tithing because his people are under a curse. Kind of like we were reading about in Malachi, right? They're living under a curse. There's uh, problems financially all over the land. And Hezekiah says, listen, maybe we just need to reinstate God's way of doing things and start tithing again. Can I just, a little side note here for a second. When we are in a restaurant, I hope that there's not a single one of us that would consume a meal and at the end of it, get up and walk out without paying the check. I think all of us would recognize that that's theft, right? That it's wrong to do that. It doesn't matter if you didn't like it. It doesn't matter if, you know, it wasn't exactly, we wouldn't just get up and walk away. That's wrong, and I don't know why, for so many people, right, we, we walk in, and we're part of a community of faith where we're being fed spiritually over and over again. Our children are being fed spiritually. Our students are being fed spiritually. And yet somehow, week after week, we come in and we eat and we walk away without participating and covering the cost of, of ministry. That doesn't make sense to me. But here, let me, let me keep going. Chronicles, Second Chronicles 31. It says, in addition, he required the people in Jerusalem to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord. What Hezekiah says as the king of Judah is, listen, we're being cursed as a, as a people because we're not tithing. So he orders the people to bring a tithe and to, to, to bring it and to essentially uh, put it here in front of the priests and Levites. Let me say this too, another side note. I'm not talking about any of this because ACC is hurting financially. In fact, ACC is experiencing more financial blessing than we've ever experienced, I, I would argue, in at least the history of me being a part of this church. Right now, we have uh, an abundance 
which is an incredible thing to be able to say. I just want you to know, this isn't like some fundraiser to, to buy me a plane, okay? This is just a principle that we see in Scripture that I want to make sure you see that tithing is a blessing. Remember, remember this, in fact. God did not create giving for his sake. He created it for your sake. When I say that tithing is a blessing, you're going to see that blessing poured out here in 2 Chronicles. Here, here's the blessing. If we keep reading in verses 5 and 6. It says, When the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing the first share, we'll talk about that again next week, of their grain and new wine and olive oil, honey and all the produce of their fields. And they brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. Remember, a tithe means what? A tenth of all they produced. They put, uh, the peop- sorry, the people who had moved to Judah from Israel, all the people of Judah themselves, they brought the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats, and the tithe of the things that uh, they had uh, that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in great heaps. And we keep reading in verses 7 through 9. It says, They began piling up in the late spring, and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people Israel. Where did all this come from? Hezekiah asks the priests and Levites. Then let's, let's look at one more verse. Verse 10, it says, And Azariah the high priest from the family of Zadok replied, Since the people began bringing their tithes, their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed his people, and all of this is left over. Imagine this. Hezekiah walks in. After the people have started re- reinstating this, this, this act of generosity through giving of their tithe, and he sees piles that are so big that what he's thinking in this moment is, hold on, somebody messed up my order. I asked everyone to give a tithe of a tenth of their income, and somehow it looks like everybody brought everything. He says, what's going on that somehow somebody got the the decree that I gave out wrong because there's way too much here? And they said, man, if you think this is a lot, you should see the other 90%. As soon as the people started giving generously the way God commanded, the blessings began to pour and pour and pour and and, and to the point where people were just bringing their 10%, they had more than they knew what to do with. As soon as people started giving, the blessings began to pour out. You see, as a follower of Christ, one thing I've learned and I know to be true, and I know there are other people in this room, many other people in this room that know this to be true, is that 90% of my income goes much further with God's blessing than 100% of my income goes without it. Let me say that again. 90% of my income has always gone so much further with God's blessing than 100% of my income goes without God's blessing. The way I know that to be true is I've heard the testimonies of many of you in this church. And I have two different testimonies that I've heard over and over again. Everyone kind of fits into one of these two testimonies. Let me give you the first testimony. People who are tithing faithfully to their church, this is the testimony they give every single time. I am so blessed. They might have a version of that. They might talk about what happened and what happened in the hospital or what happened with their uh, promotion or what happened with their, when that somebody fixed their car or something. Some, I don't know. Sometimes it's just, you know what, I, I, there's all sorts of different versions of it, but the testimony is simply this, I am so blessed. The other testimony I hear from people who aren't yet tithing, and the testimony sounds like this, I can't afford to tithe. Well, maybe if we look at both of those testimonies and put them together, what we'll learn is that you'll never be able to afford to tithe until you start to tithe. What Hezekiah was saying to the people is, listen, I know that right now we're hurting and you bringing something into the temple and setting it up in this heap, you're not gonna be able to afford to do it. But as soon as they did, boy, were they glad they did. 
So we get to that point in our message where we ask this question, what now, God? What would you like us to do as a people? And again, this challenge is just for those of us who are followers of Jesus. If you're not sure about the church yet, listen, don't, this isn't for you. But I want to ask, uh, I want to ask you a question for a moment. If I had two friends and I said, listen, I'm going to go away for an extended trip. And I, I want to ask you both to just manage the finances of my family so that my wife and kids don't have to worry about money. I just want you to manage it for me. And what I'm going to do is each month while I'm away, I'm going to send you $10,000. I'm going to just direct deposit it right into your bank account. And what I want you to do is take a thousand of that and make sure to meet the needs of my family. Take 10% of it and, and use it to, to, to pay, pay the bills of my house and make sure the, the girls are able to, to do the things they want, my wife's taken care of and all that. The other 9,000, I just want to just be a blessing on you for will, being willing to do this. That's yours to keep. Imagine one of them, you know, I call my wife four months later. I'm like, hey, how, how are things going? How, how, how are the finances? She's like, well, your, your first friend, they're, they're sending me a thousand every month. Sometimes they actually send me a little bit more and they just really want to make sure that we're, we're doing really well. And I'm like, that's great. Uh, and the other guy, yeah, he, he sent me like 500 the first month and then like 200. And now I don't, I don't, I haven't seen anything from him in a while. Do you think I'm going to keep investing in that friend to take care of my bride? You know, the Bible calls the church, what? The bride of Christ. It's no, maybe, maybe, I think we all need to realize that this is probably a lot more personal to God than we think. He's investing into us to take care of his bride and to take care of the lost all over this world. And some of us, we just take it and we're like, you know, that 9,000, that's not enough. I'm going to take all of it and keep it for myself. And then we're surprised when blessings don't pour out. So my what now God challenge for you today is something we call the giving challenge. If it's something that you'd like to try, it's a 90 day challenge that we do here. And simply this, God tells you to test him. So we ask you for 90 days to test God, to step into giving a full tithe for 90 days. And you can do that by going to rundlecc.org slash challenge. Arundelcc.org slash challenge. And what happens is at the end of the 90 days, if what God promises to you, which is that you're not going to regret it, if at the end of 90 days you regret giving that money, you need that money back, you're like, oh, man, I'm, I'm really strapped and God did not do what he said he was going to do, then you just call our director of operations and we will send you all that money back from that 90 day period. No questions asked. We know that God is going to do what he says he's going to do and that's why we don't really worry about it. But we'll take the risk with you. We can test God together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for the, this test that you've given to us and that you allow us to give back to you. That in this reciprocal uh, a way that we get to test each other, that though you don't need anything from us, you, you invite us to be a part of the story that you're writing. And as we invest and as we show the, the, the health of our heart, and as we grow in our trust and confidence of the work that you've called us into, when our minds change from being focused on this earth and on the kingdom to come, God, that you pour out a blessing. It might not be financial, God, but we recognize you pour out a blessing that's so good for us that we would never have regretted investing in being a part of your story. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.